We're here today to speak with one of the contributors to our new book, How to Heal Our Divides. Michael McRae is a writer, story practitioner, and facilitator, using the power of personal stories to heal, harm, make meaning, and create connection. He's the author of multiple books, including his 2020 award-winning publication, I Am Not Your Enemy, Stories to Transform a Divided World. He works with organizations around the world as a story consultant, produces and hosts 10x9 Nashville Storytelling, and lectures at Lipscomb University. Michael holds a master's in conflict resolution and reconciliation from Trinity College Dublin's Belfast campus. His work has been published and discussed in places like Sojourners, Book Page, and Plow Magazine, and he's been featured guest on numerous podcasts. He lives in Nashville with his family, and you can learn more about him at michaelmccray.com. So, Michael, it's so wonderful to have you involved in this project. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a delight. So, um, we'll, we'll talk more about Michael's book, but in his book, he features several different organizations that he writes about in How to Heal Our Divide. So we're going to dive into that in a moment, but Michael, maybe you could tell folks just a little bit more about your background, how you led, uh, led the way to here. Yeah, the, you know, I'll try to resist the, the urge to tell my whole life story, right? <laughs> but I, I got interested in storytelling at a very young age when I saw the way that my, my dad would tell stories about his medical practice. He was a small town family doctor. Um, and I remember him being able to narrate stories about kind of traumatic experiences that he helped patients deal with. And I remember at one point hearing someone, my dad asking a, a list, someone who was listening to that story, why should, why tell such stories? Um, and the person responded, because if we don't hear the stories, we won't know how to act. And so I kind of at, a, at the age of 10 or 11, just got really fascinated with the role of storytelling and both making meaning and also healing harm and sort of shaping culture and, and the ways that we think about the world. And so um, ended up pursuing the study of history and learned a lot about in, in college about the how different history is when told from the perspective of those whose stories didn't get told in history. Like, what does it mean to, um, you know, like I did a class in colonial America that was from the perspective of, of Native Americans and the people that were enslaved and women, you know, the people that you don't usually hear about in colonial America. So all of those sort of experiences were, were really um, instilling in me this power of storytelling. Um, and I ended up, in, you know, as you, you read the bio, so I ended up doing work in Israel and Palestine. I went to grad school in Northern Ireland to study uh, conflict resolution. And, um, but all throughout have found my passion being the intersection of peace building and narrative and storytelling. And um, so I spent a few years working with an organization called Narrative 4 that uses personal story exchanges to build empathy among people. Um, and uh, recently left that just last year in order to to try to have my fingers in a few more pies, so to speak. And so now I've just launched this kind of consulting practice of working with organizations and individuals on how to uh, facilitate storytelling and how to tell their own stories so that they can have the most impact in the work that they're trying to do. Um, and so I get to work with amazing people all around the world right now. And it's a delight. That's very cool. A lot of fun, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the chapter that you're writing in the new book, How to Heal Our Divides, actually um, is a, uh, what I say, an outcome of the book that you wrote that I mentioned earlier, I Am Not Your Enemy, Stories to Transform a Divided World. So why don't we talk about that book first? Sure. Yeah, I, in 2015, I had the opportunity um, at, due to the funding of Texas Christian University to spend several months traveling through divided societies to try to hear the stories of how is it that people can find a way to live together well in the midst of division. And so um, uh, I went to Israel and Palestine, to Northern Ireland and to South Africa. I've since gotten to go to Rwanda as well. Um, and I, I had dozens and dozens of conversations with people who had lost loved ones to the violence uh, of their of their countries, who had committed violence themselves, were former combatants who maybe were were uh, running organizations that were designed to help people heal from the violence, and to just ask them these questions about what does reconciliation look like? How does that fit with justice? What role does forgiveness play? How is it that you can actually be neighbors with someone who committed violence against your family or against the, uh, your people group? And also then with this eye toward what does their wisdom offer to our wounds back home in America? So that was a really important thing to me to say, as an American, I don't want to just go over there and be like, oh, let me just know about what does this look like in Israel-Palestine? Because 
Uh, re- in reality, what good does that do me if I'm not then saying, so how does that now translate and how can we transplant those ideas in a way that's going to help them grow in our own place? So sometimes throughout the book, I very explicitly am doing that and I'm saying, you know, this is what this is making me think of back home in the U.S. Other times I try to tell the story in such a way that's going to help the re- lead the reader to ask those own questions themselves. Um, but I think for me, the point was to tell these stories and narrate the conversations I had in a way that helps people say, I see how that same dynamic is at work in my own city, in my own congregation, in my own, you know, country, um, in order that we might take the lessons that have are being offered to us and say, maybe it is, maybe there's a way that we can uh, find a way out of these sort of projects of animosity um, before it's too late. So. Well, that's exactly why I wanted to include, you know, you and, you know, these organizations in this book, because we need to learn, right? I mean, they've gone through a lot of terrible times. Our country now is going through a very polarized time. So we've got to learn from what other people have learned. So um, I appreciate, you know, the fact that you did all that work and, um, you know, turned it into a book. That It's a really excellent book. I highly recommend people go get that book in addition to the new one that we're coming out with. But um, maybe you could dive a little bit into the specific organizations that you're going to be highlighting in um, yeah. How to Heal Our Divides. Yeah. So in Israel and Palestine, I had the great privilege of working with um, folks from the Parent Circle Families Forum. Uh, So this is an organization that's made up of bereaved Israelis and Palestinians. Um, So these are uh, these are Israelis and Palestinians who have lost loved ones, which could be could be a cousin, could be a parent, could also be a child. And many of them have lost children. And it's an it's an organization where they are trying to find they're finding common ground over their shared sense of loss, you know, and being able to say we are the people that have the most right to perpetuate this conflict because we've lost what no one wants to lose. But it's precisely because of this loss that we're so dedicated to making sure that nobody else ever has to experience what we've experienced um, and so they, they do lots of projects together. They have narrative based projects of trying to hear the learn each other's history from the other's point of view. Um, they do they do a lot of work with youth trying to go and speak in, in schools to help um, young people understand like that the other part, the other side that is full of your enemy may also be a human being that could be your friend and um, they do joint Memorial Days. Memorial Day is a big day in Israel where you remember all the Israelis um, who have you know, died in, in war or the Jewish folks who have died in, in the Holocaust. And um, so they do a joint Memorial Day where they also remember the Palestinians that were, have been killed in the conflict. And so it's, it's just in short an organization with lots of different kind of um, work that they do, but it is fueled by this driving passion to uh, help other parents and other family members um, avoid the same loss that they have. And so what I tell uh, one of the st- several stories from them in the book, um, uh, including the last one about two men named Rami and Bassam, both of who lost daughters to one from a Palestinian suicide bomber and one from an Israeli soldier when their daughters were young and about the friendship that they have created together. Um, so that's a remarkable organization. Uh, highly recommend people check them out. There's also a new novel, a New York Times bestselling novel that came out about um, Rami and Bassam, those two men called A Paragon by Colin McCann, the Irish novelist. Um, that's A-P-E-I-R-O-G-O-N. So uh, it's, you can look up Colin McCann and you'll find it. Um, so it's a, it's a fantastic novel and being turned into a movie by Steven Spielberg, actually. So, uh, so they're about to get a lot of attention, which is fantastic. <laughs> In Northern Ireland, I got to spend a lot of time with the Cory Mila community, um, which is Ireland's oldest peace and reconciliation community. Um, it was actually started before the Troubles, which, you know, and basically started in the late 60s, um, which is the violent conflict that kind of rocked Northern Ireland for 30 years. Um, and um, it's it's has established itself in the, in the northern part of Northern Ireland, up on the coast, um, as this sort of safe haven and possibility of shelter for people who, in some cases, were literally fleeing violence during the Troubles. So um, when there was terror happening all around them, Cory Meal was a place that they could come for rest and refuge. Um, now it, it offers, it, it's a place um, where people can have retreats and gatherings together and often are meeting 
people from the other side, like, you know, former IRA and former UVF combatants, maybe s- sitting together and, and learning how is it that we can have difficult dialogue uh, without resorting to killing each other, which sounds like an exaggeration, but that's uh, can be a major step for people when you. That's what was going on. So that's exactly what was going on. So it's it is this. How is it that we can sit here? You know, this kind of the idea of how can I say what I need to say in such a way that allows us to stay in the room with each other? You know, is there a way that we can have this conversation without having to grab our guns? Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll tell a lot more about it in the in the chapter. But it's a um, it's another chapter I also wrote in my book called Place of Lumpy Cross. The book's I'm Not Your Enemy, but the chapter is Place of Lumpy Crossings. Um, which is a, just a, the, this a quick story on that because it's a really lovely story is that the name Cory Mila is this old Irish name. And when they established this center on the land, um, the, um, they named the place Cory Mila, which they thought meant Hill of Harmony. And they thought, isn't that just going to be lovely to have this like reconciliation community on the Hill of Harmony? Um, but they, uh, somebody finally came along several years later who knew what they were talking about when it came to old Irish etymology and said, it actually doesn't mean Hill of Harmony at all. It means something like place of lumpy crossings. And everyone <laughs> just like felt such a sense of relief because they were like, wow, because that name actually holds us because Hill of Harmony is not what the work of reconciliation actually looks and feels like. It much more feels like a place of lumpy crossings where we're stumbling <laughs> into each other. And so there was like oh, this great. Really yeah, and this realization of the name. So, um, and then in South Africa, I got to spend time with the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in Cape Town, um, learning about their youth work, their community uh, development work, um, some of their research as well. But they do some remarkable um, work in this new South Africa of trying to help um, young people, I think, in especially, but also broader society and understanding what is it that democracy looks like? How what's the relationship of justice to reconciliation? That there was this huge emphasis, of course, in South Africa on truth and reconciliation. But there's a lot of conversation, especially now, being like, and what about justice? Like, what about the all the the land that was stolen from the people of color in South Africa. What happens? What do reparations look like? You know, how are our living conditions actually improving? What's the role of economics in the conversations on reconciliation and justice? You know, um, and so they're 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 an institute for justice and reconciliation that is putting a lot of emphasis on. Um, the ability of people to actually live well, not just with their enemy, but like, can they, are they making ends meet? Can people have a, a happy life? Because when people are happy and thriving, they're far less likely to be in conflict with other people, right? There's so much that peace building sometimes misses and it's um, focus on just the quality of relationships and not on the actual living conditions of people. Um, and so this is an organization that has, is trying to pay a lot of attention to that. So I had some really amazing conversations with them as well. Um, and then if I have time in the chapter, I'm going to talk a little bit about Rwanda as well. And this remarkable organization there called Sevota, S-E-V-O-T-A, um, which was founded by a, a Rwandan woman named Godalive. And she, it is essentially an organization of women who were bereaved and brutalized by the genocide, um, many of whom suffered incredible sexual violence and trauma. And that Savota, as I, as I understand it, started um, through dance, that it's, that's been its primary methodology for healing is um, in the sexual violence that happened to these women, they, their bodies were violated and therefore they became disconnected in a lot of ways from their bodies and dance became a way for them to re-inhabit their bodies in a way that could actually bring some sense of joy. Um, And so uh, I'll probably tell a story just about what it was like to dance with them when I got to go and to be in Taba, Rwanda and to see these women knowing that almost all of them, if not all of them had been experienced incredible sexual violence, had had their children butchered, literally butchered, had their loved ones butchered and sometimes been butchered by family members. That's what was so um, another form of terror of the genocide is the people you thought you could trust, you realized you couldn't trust. Um, And to see them with smiles on their faces, finding a way to to have a bit of joy in the life that they have now through dance. Um, And so just to show these different examples of peace building and healing divides takes on many different forms. Sometimes it's sitting down and having tea and difficult conversations. Sometimes it's talking, you know, with your supposed enemy in school. Sometimes it's dancing uh, on a, a dirt floor in, a, uh, in an old school building, you know, so um, there are lots of ways to do the work that we need to do. 
So if I understand correctly, like in the case of Corey Mila, um, they have had on the order of 10,000 people per year participate year. in their, you know, peacemaking sessions. I'm not sure what the right term is, but sure. yeah. That's, yeah. 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 Well, mm -hmm. sorry. I said that's children as well that come through. So it's it's people that come there for retreats, maybe that focus conversation. It's it's bridging divides, sort of mediations. There's all kinds of programs that that can happen at Corey Mila. But yeah, about ten thousand people a year. I mean, that's a pretty significant impact. You know, just kind of like I don't know what the population of Ireland is, but I mean, I know it's a lot larger than that, obviously. But that's a pretty, you know, you're doing that about every year. Yeah. So yeah. what's your feeling on? the cultural, the broader cultural impact that these different organizations are having within their countries. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what kind of pulse I have on that. Um, I, my sense is that Corey Mila is pretty well respected um, across all of the Island of Ireland. Um, I was just on a call actually earlier today, facilitating a workshop for people in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and I mentioned that I spent a lot of time at Corey Mila and most people knew where that was, even though it's in the North. Um, so the, it has a, it has a, I think a, a strong reputation um, and, and it has a very broad network because they have the Corey Mila community is in one sense, um, the community that's housed at the center. There are people that live on site and work there. Um, but then there's also people that are sort of in the Corey Mila network. So people who sort of, uh, it's sort of this idea of like pledging to live by Corey Mila values and you're sort of, you become part of the network. And so in little towns, there are small Corey Mila groups where they get together and they try to have some intentional ways of being together. So they have this broad reach uh, in that way. You know, the parent circle and others, um, they have in some of their roles are spokespeople. And so they have people whose job it is to go around the world carrying this message. And so I meet people all over the world who have heard of the parent circle and have met some of those, um, those individuals, um, other places where work is modeled even after the parent circle. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think the same in, in Rwanda, um, go to leave who established Sivota, um, has been honored in multiple places. Documentaries have been made about her work. And so there is a sense to which I think they're able to see that their work is there in their own place, but that they also are trying to, um, to take the impact of that to other spaces in the world so that they can kind of populate those seeds and let that work grow other places as well. Well, I think, you know, back to our conversation about learning from what other people have done and experienced. I mean, particularly what you just talked about in terms of Corey Mila where they have built satellite forums, so to speak, you know, replicating to some degree what happens at their actual facility in their actual retreats, yeah. but in geographically dispersed, you know, locations. Yeah. And, you know, talk about a model for us to use here, mm -hmm. right? You know, in the United States where any of the organizations that we're featuring in our book that are, you know, U.S. based organizations, I mean, can only do so much each one, you know, right. in terms of their scope. But to the extent that that scope can be, you know, replicated and emulated in other cities, other organizations, whatever you, that's a really important thing to try to make happen. Yeah, absolutely. So of all the, you know, different experiences that you went through, which, you know, is, is just an outstanding book that you wrote about that. I mean, what are some of the most important learnings that you would say that you took away from that, that we should be applying here in the U.S.? Yeah. I think that, I mean, one was what I learned in one of my very first conversations. I, I, I titled the first chapter, Dialogue is Not the Goal. Um, and this was with a Palestinian peace builder named Ali Abu Awad, who um, who in all of his work trying to be in dialogue with Israelis and with settlers and others um, kind of came to this realization of saying for so many people um, dialogue becomes the goal. And I hear this a lot in the U S right. If we could just sit down and talk, but Ali's point was what happens after that, right? Like what's, are you even imagining that something comes after the dialogue or is dialogue the goal itself? And so he said, dialogue can never be my goal. It is my carrier to freedom. And I found that so helpful to think about, like, are we seeing dialogue as a tool or is it our end goal? If it's our end goal, we need to reevaluate our priorities and imagine beyond that, that dialogue is, should be a tool in service of 
liberation from oppression in service of, um, you know, um, removing the obstacles that keep people's living conditions um, uh, in desperate uh, uh, in kind of desperate ways. And so I think that that was really quite challenging for me. Um, I think understanding then the connection, it kind of tag moves into this connection between justice and reconciliation, that these ideas can't be pitted against each other, that you can't pursue only the quality of relationships while ignoring the issues of systemic injustice that, that are keeping people apart to begin with and perpetuating the conflict. But you also can't just deal with the systems of injustice and not address the quality of relationships and trust. These things have to go together. And so um, it doesn't mean that everyone has to be doing all of that work at the same time. I do think there's a, a role for being able to say, what am I compelled to do or what am I particularly good at? You know, that one of my gifts, I think, is in facilitating these encounters between people. And that's where I want to give most of my time. But then my question is, who's doing the work of systemic injustice and addressing that? How can I build collaborations there? What does that horizontal capacity look like? Um, so thinking about developing that network was also really helpful. You know, Corey Mila taught me about the importance of having those safe harbors, you know, to, to dock in for a while. But sometimes you got to get out of the of, and that that's part of the of, you know, it's an overused term now, but it's part of the self-care. Like you can't just stay in it all the time. You we need people who are also cultivating those spaces for people to find a way to like get a breath, <laughs> you know, before they go back into it. Um, even even in like, you know, in, in the religious tradition that I grew up in, in Christianity, like Jesus went up to the mountaintops right before he went back into the cities. And so sometimes you, you got to be able to go out of, of the cities for a bit into the mountains. Um, and then, you know, thinking also just about, I remember one of the uh, folks I spoke with in South Africa, Tim Balanzi, one of the lines he said to me was, there's a difference between knowledge and acknowledgement. Um, and just the moving from just being like, oh, I, I need to understand the impact of racism or whatever it might be to saying, and then what does it look like to acknowledge that with your actions and in your relationships? How do we move from simply trying to know something to then having that manifest in the way and in, in a changed behavior in our lives so that we're acknowledging things? Um, it, the list is very long of things I learned. So, you know, that's why I had to turn it into a book, but uh, those are, those are really important points. You know, thank you for, you know, for highlighting those because it's, that's, it, these are all very complex issues, yeah. multidimensional. And uh, so there's no one pithy, you know, answer to any of that. I mean, obviously if that was the case, then it wouldn't be such a big deal, but. Right. Um, so another dimension of this whole thing is that you do consulting with organizations to help them with some of these kinds of issues. So maybe could you talk a little bit about how you can help folks in that regard? Yeah, so the consulting looks very different depending on the needs of people. Um, for any interested, you can find that on my website, michaelmccray.com slash consulting. But um, some of the projects that I get to do right now, for instance, I'm working with, a, with this Palestinian man I mentioned, Ali Abu Awad, who's writing a manifesto on the need for an independent Palestinian national nonviolence movement. And so I, he's, he's asked me to help him kind of craft the structure of that and what's the narrative, the overarching narrative of, of his ideas and his vision. So I'm working on a very specific kind of um, written project in that way. Um, I also have had I consult with this organization Narrative 4 to facilitate story exchanges where we'll bring groups together and have them actually, you know, pair up and tell uh, stories to one another based on some kind of theme or prompt that they're interested in having a conversation about. Um, I do values discernment work for people. So, I, you know, organizations that are trying to figure out who exactly are we and what is it that we care about, I facilitate a process to help them um, through storytelling to name the values that they have and how to articulate those um, and then I also work with organizations to mine and tell the most impactful stories from their work. So, um, so there's a great organization here in Tennessee called the Imagination Library from Dolly Parton. And um, so I got to work with, with volunteers for that organization. This is an organization that's trying to provide a, um, a book a month to every child from zero to five for free. Um, and so I got to work with their, their teams of volunteers to help them to go through a process to help them 
um, ask them the right questions to find impactful stories from when they've seen the work of the Imagination Library make it have an impact in people's lives, and then to work with them on how do you tell that in a way that's going to influence people to actually get involved, you know, to create engagement and belief in your work so that people will act. Um, so I can do work with people in all kinds of ways, all centered in, in storytelling, and I also do mediations as well, so specific conflict resolution work. Um, so it's a variety of not boring, I, I would no. say. Is the, <laughs> Thankfully, it's very busy right now, which is like both good and like sad that, you know, that uh, that we've we've been so story impoverished for so long that there's like this real like people are famished for it. And so people like me who are doing storytelling work facilitation are actually in hot demand right now because there's suddenly this hunger, which is nice in one way that people are paying attention and wanting it now and it's also this sense of like oh how is this just not a natural part of the way that we live <laughs> so do you think you know once we're further past the pandemic that there's going to be like this flood of demand for yeah. in-person meetings like this i think yeah but i also have found that you can do you can do this stuff very effectively online as well like it is right. very different to sit in a room with folks um uh, but you you can have a great impact in this work, even doing it on on Zoom, um, which I find a lot of organizations are happy about in terms of their budgets because you don't have to pay someone to fly anymore, right? You sure, can sure. hop on Zoom. And I, I also love it because now I can do my program and then go play with my one-year-old son, right? And I don't have to like be gone from home for a week to do something. Um, so like I was able to do some projects in for a group in India recently. And so I, it required me to be up at 10 p.m., but I was able to do six projects for them and still be at home with my family as opposed to being on a plane for 20 hours, you know? So like there, there are some really nice improvements in that way. Huge, huge difference once you remove the geographic yeah. the travel kinds of uh, requirements. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's so great to spend time with you and I uh, really appreciate you contributing to this book. Thank you for all the wonderful work that you've done, um, you know, both looking back and, you know, what you're doing right now. Thank you very much. I appreciate you inviting me to be a part of this and for doing the project yourself. So. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Cheers.